There is a tuber that matches the potato in yield. It thrives on marginal soils where nothing else will grow. It comes in every color of the rainbow and tastes like sweet fruit after a frost. And it was feeding civilizations 8,000 years before Europeans arrived. Then the conquistadors decided it looked too much like survival without their permission. They chose the potato for their empire and left this one to fade. This is the story of the crop they buried to keep you hungry. Welcome to Nature Lost Vault. The archive opens in the Peruvian coastal desert at archaeological sites near modern Lima. Researchers digging in the dry sands discovered something extraordinary. Preserved tubers, small, colorful, cylindrical, and with a distinctive bumpy texture. Carbon dating placed them at 4,250 years old. But that was just the coast. Higher in the Andes, at a site called Tres Ventanas, at an elevation of 4,000 meters, researchers found evidence suggesting this crop may have been cultivated for 10,000 years. 10 millennia of human partnership with a single plant. Before the pyramids. Before written language. Before the first brick was laid in Rome. But here is what makes these finds so significant. They were not found alongside potato remains. They were found at sites where potatoes could not reliably grow. This was not a backup crop. This was the primary food source for people farming the edges of what was possible. The plant they turned to when altitude, cold, and poor soil made other crops fail. This is ochre, scientifically known as Oxalis tuberosa, the second most important tuber of the Andes. For 8,000 years, Quechua and Aymara farmers cultivated ochre in rotation with potatoes, planting it on marginal land, on high slopes, on poor soils that even potatoes struggled with. They called it UK, and they engineered it into a masterpiece of food security. They developed two distinct categories based on chemistry. The bitter varieties, called luki or pusk, contained high levels of oxalic acid. Farmers would soak these tubers in water for a month, then freeze-dry them in the harsh Andean nights to create kaya, a preserved food that could be stored for years as a hedge against famine. The sweet varieties, called miski, were exposed to sunlight for several days after harvest. The sun reduced the acid and increased the glucose, turning a root vegetable into something that could be eaten raw, like a fruit, or boiled, baked, and fried like a sweet potato. The diversity was astounding. Tubers ranged from white and cream to neon pink, deep red and purple. Farmers named varieties with poetry, such as black ash and red cosmos flower. This was botanical artistry developed over millennia. And the nutritional profile explains why ochre became so critical to Andean survival. Fresh ochre contains 42% more vitamin C than potatoes. It has 45% more iron. It has nearly four times the fiber. It is high in protein with a balanced amino acid profile, all while being lower in calories and carbohydrates than the potato. But the real genius of ochre was its agricultural role. Traditional Andean farmers planted it at altitudes up to 4,100 meters, that is 13,000 feet. It grew on slopes where tractors would roll. It grew in soils depleted by other crops. It required no fertilizers, no pesticides, just occasional weeding. And the yields were staggering. Under traditional methods, it matched the potato. But with modern virus-free seed stock, ochre, can produce up to 55 tons per hectare. That is higher than many commercial potato varieties. And ochre accomplishes this on land where the potato would fail. This was not subsistence farming. This was sophisticated agricultural engineering designed to extract maximum nutrition from difficult terrain. Ceramic urns from 1,000 years ago depict ochre alongside other revered crops. It was a staple, 
a pillar of the empire. Chronicles from the Spanish conquest describe it as highly valued. But those same chronicles document what happened next. On November 16, 1532, Francisco Pizarro captured the Inca Emperor Atahualpa. Despite receiving a room filled with gold as ransom, Pizarro executed him. The Spanish crown and church demanded that European crops replace indigenous ones. Wheat, barley, broad beans. These were the crops of civilization in Spanish eyes. The foods of the Inca were deliberately erased, forced into obscurity. But the Spanish did make one exception. They selected the potato. Why the potato and not oca? The answer reveals everything about the logic of colonial control. Potatoes were convenient food for slaves in the silver mines. Potatoes fit the European agricultural model of large monoculture fields. And crucially, potatoes had less diversity. The Spanish could standardize potato cultivation more easily than the hundreds of localized oca varieties. Oca represented something dangerous to colonial power. It represented agricultural knowledge that existed outside European understanding. It represented food security that did not depend on European seeds or methods. It represented the ability of indigenous peoples to survive independently on marginal lands that the Spanish could not easily control or tax. So Oka was systematically marginalized. It was stigmatized as poor man's tuba, associated with backwardness and poverty. This stigma persisted for nearly five centuries. Even today, in urban Peru and Bolivia, oca is often seen as rural peasant food. The crop that fed the Inca for 8,000 years was reduced to a garden vegetable. But here is what the Spanish could not erase. The biological reality of what oca represents. You cannot patent an 8,000-year-old crop. You cannot force farmers to buy new oca seeds every year because oca propagates vegetatively from tubers. Any farmer who grows oca can save their own planting material forever. You cannot require fertilizers because oca thrives on poor soils. You cannot create dependency because oca is adapted to harsh conditions where corporate agriculture struggles. Oka presents agricultural sovereignty. That has always been the threat. It is not that oka is inferior to potatoes. It is that oka allows people to feed themselves without participating in the industrial system. But knowledge is harder to kill than plants. The modern rediscovery of oka began quietly in the gene banks. The International Potato Center in Peru now maintains more than 800 varieties, preserved as insurance against loss. Researchers like Dr. Eve Emschwiller spent decades using DNA sequencing to trace Oke back to its wild ancestors, proving its complexity and ancient lineage. Emschwiller found that what farmers call a single variety is often a mix of multiple genotypes. That complexity is exactly what makes ochre impossible to commodify. You cannot patent a crop with this much farmer-maintained diversity. But the most successful modern adoption of ochre happened far from the Andes. In 1860, ochre was introduced to New Zealand, likely on whaling ships. New Zealanders recognized what the Spanish had deliberately ignored. That ochre it was hardy, that it was nutritious, that it tasted good. They called it New Zealand yam, even though it is not a yam. And they have cultivated it commercially ever since. Today you can buy oka in New Zealand supermarkets. It is eaten raw in salads, roasted like potatoes, and added to stews. New Zealand farmers proved that oka does not need industrial agriculture to succeed. It just needs respect for what it is. A perennial tuber that produces abundant food on marginal lands with minimal inputs. Exactly what the world needs as the climate becomes less predictable and industrial agriculture becomes less sustainable. The ochre plant is beautiful. 
It grows low with thick, succulent stems and clover-like leaves. The leaves are edible, tart like sorrel. The flowers are edible, but the real value lies underground. Ochre is a creature of light. It requires short days to form tubers. In the autumn, as the days shorten, the plant directs its energy downward. The longer they remain in the soil, the bigger they get. In regions with harsh winters, harvest happens after the first frost. The cold actually improves the flavor, turning starches into sugars. The tubers can be stored for months in a cool room. No high-tech refrigeration required. And here is the remarkable part. Outside of the Andes, ochre has virtually no pests or diseases. In Europe and North America, it grows with almost zero pressure. This is agricultural gold, a nutritious, productive crop that requires minimal inputs and faces almost no threats. Yet it remains virtually unknown to the rest of the world. Why? Because ochre represents a type of agriculture that cannot be controlled. It cannot be patented. It cannot be sold annually. It cannot require purchased inputs. It cannot be standardized. Ochre is agricultural sovereignty in physical form, and that is exactly why it was suppressed. Not because it was inferior, but because it was too good at what it did. The knowledge lives in the soil, in tubers passed from farmer to farmer, in the strategic planting on marginal lands that maximizes food production across difficult terrain. This knowledge isn't lost. It's waiting for us to remember. If this vault opened something for you, please subscribe to Nature Lost Vault and hit the bell. Every like and every share helps preserve this wisdom. The next vault opens soon.